So this evening's discussion, as you can see, is the Vimalakirti Sutra, chapter 6, and one translation of it is Beyond, beyond Comprehension. And there's no handout tonight, and I just wanted to address that. If I'm, a, if I'm discussing a sutra, and you see it in the Shingi, in the, the newsletter, read the chapter of the sutra. There's no reason for a handout. And with this particular sutra, it's especially useful because there are at least four uh, translations that I'm aware of that are free online, including the one that we're using, which is the Burton Watson uh, translation. Is the newsletter an email? The, the Shingi is the newsletter. Okay. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's an email. Yeah. Do you, you get it? I don't think so. Well, see him and you'll get it. <laughs> Sir. So, uh, so just be aware that if I'm, if I'm discussing a sutra, excuse me, especially one in which there are free copies online, then I'm not going to do a handout because mm -hmm. Read the chapter. That's the best way to, to see what we're talking about. Um, next, please. <clears throat> and as way of background, and, and I've used this before, but we have people that came in that haven't seen the previous five chapters, and this is still uh, an adequate background. The Vimalakirti Sutra focuses on a lay person. And this is really important because it's the only sutra. Well, actually, one of two. Queen Shramala is also written about a lay person. Um, but this particular sutra is about this particular, this particular lay person, Vimalakirti, um, who, interestingly enough, exceeded the spiritual prowess of all of Shakyamuni Buddha's disciples, bodhisattvas, gods, and goddesses. This guy was one hell of a Dharma guy. That's what it really comes down to. And it starts with Vimalakirti pretending to be sick in bed. And I say pretending. Remember the term pretending here. To attract an audience of visitors who come to wish him well and inquire about his health. And the sutra reaches its climax because the sutra, what is the sutra about? And it reaches its climax when Vimalakirti asks his audience of bodhisattvas, to describe the nature of non-duality. Just as a side note, something that isn't on here, there are some scholars that suggest that this particular sutra is what gave rise to Nagarjuna's work on emptiness. And so it, it's an important sutra for lots of reasons that we'll discuss later on, but it may in fact have been a preceding uh, Nagarjuna. Now, the difficulty I have with that, according to the scholars, is Nagarjuna was second century. We don't have evidence of this until approximately third century. So it may very well have been written before the third century. We just don't have evidence of it until that time. Next, next slide. Some important points. And the first point is that it's a sutra that makes the point, and I'll, I'll expand on this in just a moment, that awakening does not depend upon ordination. For people sitting here, you're saying, so what? Well, in the second century CE in China, when it was when Buddhism was being going from China to, uh, excuse me, from India to Sri Lanka in the south and, and all the way to Afghanistan, Kajikistan in the west, and then to China in the east. It was being transmitted by practitioners from India who were um, what we now refer to as Theravada. And in the Theravada teachings, one had to attain awakening before one could attain, excuse me, one had to uh, be ordained previous to awakening. And so the fact that this, as a Mahayana Sutra, it's an early Mahayana Sutra, makes the point of you don't have to be ordained. That became a really big deal. And, and you'll notice that the language in this sutra is not coincidentally aimed uh, at saying the Mahayana, as it now exists, 
is superior to what would be referred to at that time as the Hinayana. We refer to it now as, as Theravada. Uh, so this was a sutra that was also had an agenda. And the agenda was, it was purely Mahayana. It was purely visionary as opposed to looking at psychological insight, which is the way Musong would refer to um, uh, the Theravada. Second thing is, we see the use of Upaya in this sutra. As a matter of fact, Upaya, because when Vimla Kirti was in his sickbed, he was using Upaya. He wasn't really sick. He used that as a device to get people in the village or the town city that he lived in to come and visit him as a way for him to convey <coughs> the Dharma. Now, Full disclosure here, I'm not using my illness as a way to get you to come here for me to reveal the Dharma. So full disclosure, this is not my trick, you know. Well, what, why is this important? In the Pali Canon, you find Buddhism has two primary objectives, and that is compassion and wisdom. We find in the Mahayana the introduction of Upaya. It's not to say that Upaya did not exist in the Pali Canon, but it was not really uh, a major feature. It wasn't, it wasn't something that, that was being put forward as necessary. So in the Mahayana, you have Prajna, which is the wisdom, and Karuna, which is compassion, and Upaya, or skillful means, hold those two together, and leads one to the other. And, and it's a very involved um, process, but it becomes an essential aspect of Mahayana teachings, unlike the earlier Nikaya teachings. So, um, and specifically in this sutra, it's taught that Nirvana and Samsara, at an ultimate level, are not different, which was, again, a, a repudiation of the Arhat idea in which Nirvana is Nirvana, <coughs> Samsara is Samsara. Here we see that nirvana and samsara are really different and not different, one and the same, yet different. And this then becomes the idea of, of these two truths of upaya, excuse me, of nirvana and samsara become mediated through the middle way that takes place at later times. So this predates the notion of the third truth as the, as the one truth. The third thing is Vimla Kirti asserts that a bodhisattva is able to live in the world, engaging in it fully, even to the point of partaking in its pleasures, passions, and defilements, without being attached to them, constrained by them, or corrupted by them. And what this means is looking at the nature of what the bodhisattva is, the bodhisattva lives a life, period. But in so doing, maintains the sense of purity of working toward the benefit of all sentient beings, which is a, a really important concept in the Mahayana. Next, please. <coughs> so, narrative thus far. I, this, this, this sort of looks like Sam, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what do you think? Since he isn't here to defend himself, we can say that, right? So, Burton Watson argues that the doctrine of emptiness is the central teaching of the Sutra, along with the related idea that since all dharmas are of nature, they are non dual, having a single ultimate quality. And the Vimalakirti Sutra is one of the oldest sutras and contains the Majamaka philosophy of emptiness or shunyata as a foundational element and thus served as a foundation of, perhaps, the Nargojana school. The story thus far is that Shakyamuni Buddha has asked his disciples and bodhisattvas to visit the noble layman and Vimla Kirti to inquire about his illness. All have declined because they claim Vimla Kirti has humbled them in the past, demonstrating his superior knowledge of the teachings and practices except for Manjushri the Bodhisattva of Wisdom, which was in chapter five, the previous chapter. And, and just a, a quick remark about that. Think about 
this sutra also, in its humor, you've got you've got Shakyamuni Buddha saying to Shariputra, his chief disciple, Shariputra, we've heard that Vimalakirti is suffering from some, some sort of illness, and I want you to go to his city and find out what's going on. You know, we're, we're concerned about it, you know. And, and Shariputra says, oh no, not me, I'm not going. No way, Jose, the last time I met this guy, he read me the riot act about how I didn't know what I was talking about, I didn't have good practices, etc., etc., etc. Now, if you're a, a Buddhist in 300, or you're just a person sitting in, in listening to this story uh, in an oral tradition in a, in a, around a campfire, here it is, you have a story that's about a sutra in which one of the chief disciples is saying, not me, I'm not going. There's a, there's a sense of humor to that, which I think that we don't really look at very closely. But there's also a kind of irreverence, because first he goes to Shariputra, then he goes to Maj Maj um, uh, Ma Magdalena, then he goes to Ma Kasyapa, then he goes to the Bodhisattva. Everybody's turning him down. Think about this. In a, the humor of, of the, here's this lay person that is, <laughs> just has embarrassed all these great disciples and bodhisattvas, right? Mm -hmm. There's something really attractive about that idea, I think. So, moving in, even Munjushri feels humbled by Vimla Kirti, but he agrees to go visit the layman. Then a great host of disciples, Buddhas, bodhisattvas, <laughs> gods and goddesses, decide to go along to witness because a conversation between Vimalakirti and Manjushri would be incredibly illuminating. The other way of looking at it is this would be an early World Federation wrestling match, <laughs> <laughs> verbal wrestling match, you know. Uh, let, let's go check this out. Man, I can just see these two guys going into it. Now, you'll recall at the end of chapter 5, Manjushri arrives at Vimala Kirti's house and is shown to a bare room with only a single cot with Vimala Kirti lying in it. And the room was small, with dozens of disciples, thousands of, we're talking about a small room, by the way, not as big as this room. We're talking about a room that's by 10 by 10. As a matter of fact, it's been uh, hypothesized that Vimala Kirti, um, the, the personage of Vimla Kirti may have been based upon somebody who lived in a room that by today's standard would be t about 10 foot by 10 foot. Uh, so that's the size of the room. And you've got these dozens of disciples, uh, thousands of bodhisattvas and heavily beings crammed into the space. Crammed, I think, is a maybe not an appropriate term. Vimla Kirti goes on to eloquently explain the basics of Buddhist teachings to the assembled. However, Nobody could be expected, could it be expected the extraordinary nature of the meeting as it progresses. <coughs> Beyond comprehension. So this is actually from the sutra. Shakyamuni. <laughs> As, oh, I'm sorry. At that time, Shariputra, observing that there are no seats in Vimal Kirti's room, thought to himself, all these bodhisattvas and major disciples, where are they going to sit? Reasonable question. The rich man, Vimal Kirti, knowing what was in his mind, said to Shariputra, did you come here for the sake of the law, or are you just looking for a place to sit? Again, a little bit of humor here, right? I came here for the law, not for the seats, said Shariputra. Ah, Shariputra, said Vimla Kirti, a seeker of the law doesn't concern himself even about life or limb, much less about a seat. A seeker of the law seeks nothing in the way of form, perception, conception, volition, or consciousness. He seeks nothing in the way of sense realms or sense media. He seeks nothing in the threefold world of desires, forms, and formlessness. And to continue, O Shariputra, a seeker of the law does not seek it through the attachment to the Buddha, does not seek it through the attachment to the law, does not seek it through the attachment to the order. 
The seeker of the law does not seek it through recognition of suffering, does not seek it through the renunciation of attachments, and does not seek it through the realization of how to end attachments or the practice of the way. Why? Because the law has nothing to do with idle theorizing. To declare that one must recognize suffering, renounce attachments, realize how to reach extinction, and practice the way is mere idle theorizing, not seeking the law. And by the way, the way in this context, uh, Burton Watson footnotes, is reference to the Four Noble Truths. And the reason I mention that is because in many cases, when we see the way being referenced, the way is the Tao. It's the same as the Tao in Taoism. In this case, it's speaking about the Four Noble Truths. The text continues to delineate what the law is and is not, and it, and it goes on like this for quite some time. Um, the point being that the law is, is unconditional, and the law meaning the Four Noble Truths, and hence the Dharma, is unconditional. It's not provisional. It's beyond. It's absolute. Um, but the ways in which we see it are all conditioned. So <coughs> we're sitting here having this discussion. Each of us has our own perceptions of this discussion. Each of us has our own perceptions of what each of the words I'm using are. We know that, right? That's a given. That's conditioning. The way is beyond such conditioning, beyond such provisionality. And this becomes an important point. <coughs> Excuse me. Vimala Kirti then goes on to state, therefore, Shariputra, if one would be a seeker of law, one must not seek it in anything at all. Now, I will I will ask the question that that Chip is dying to ask, then what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> I knew you were going to ask that question. We'll get to that later. Um, I, I just, uh, what we're doing here is because we're getting a potluck eventually. That's, <laughs> right. that's, that's, that, that's the bottom. Upon hearing this, 500 heavenly beings gained the purity of the Dharma eye and their perception of phenomena. In other words, what it's saying is that the 500 heavenly beings, upon hearing that, recognized the reality of that statement. That reality is not in our experiential existence. Reality is beyond what we can, into, what we can experience through the senses and through our own volition, etc. Now we move on to the fantastic area in which Vimla Kirti uses transcendental powers. Here, I'm using the term that Burton uses, transcendental. Keep this in mind. To create seats for the assembled party based upon the seats of the Sumeru Lamp King. Seats that were approximate for, appropriate for the Buddha's body, which was 84,000 yojanas in height, referred to as a lion seat. So the, the Buddha himself was 84,000 yojanas uh, tall, and the seat was also 84,000 yojanas. By the way, a yojana is a really interesting measure because, you know, when we think about a meter, we know that in Paris there is a metric stick made of some metal, I don't recall what it is, that's being held for posterity in a room that's a vacuum that's of a certain length that we make reference to, right? That meter stick is the reference for what a meter is in the world. They also have weights there, you know, what's a gram, what's a kilogram, etc. But this meter stick, you know, John is interesting because we don't know how long the Yojana was. And the reason we don't know is because the Ojana, as a measure, changed under each empire. <laughs> and so at one point, it was five kilometers. At another point, it could be 10 kilometers. At another point, it could be 15 kilometers. So this measure changed throughout history. 
which I find really fascinating. You have a measure, you know. You, you can understand they say that the, that the foot was contrived because, I don't know, one of the kings, I'll say Henry VIII, because why not? Um, that that was the length of one foot. They measured his foot and he said, that's a foot. I doubt that that was actually his foot because at that time people were not that tall and I doubt that he had a size, whatever a foot would be. Um, anyway, here we have a situation in which a yojana can be various, but there's a kind of magic to that when you think about it, because this whole tale is fantastic. This whole tale is about using one's imagination. And so what a yojana is, is really, I mean, the actual measurement is really irrelevant because it's just saying, this was one hell of a big chair, is what they're saying, right? Um, in the same way that, that you know, a culpus, you know, what, what, is, what is the, the culpus is a measurement of time, and there are codes of culpuses, and when they ask how many, um, what is the measurement of a culpus, how many of what is in a culpus, the answer is, imagine that, each grain of sand held all the grains of sand in the Ganges. That's one kalpas. So, and then you've got all the grains of sand in the Ganges. That's 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 a kalpas. Um, <clears throat> where was I? Here's a selected element of the chapter because the chapter I don't know how many pages it is, but it's too much to read. So I'll oh, sure. I didn't look at it. I didn't no. realize it was going to... No, it, it's good over here. It's, it's over there. It's just over there. It's okay. Um, Vimla Kirti said, Ashari Putra, the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas have an emancipation that is called beyond comprehension, hence the title of the chapter. When a Bodhisattva dwells in this emancipation, he can take something as tall and broad as Mount Sumeru and put it inside a mustard seed without enlarging one or shrinking the other. And Mount Sumeru, king of mountains, will still have its original shape. Moreover, the four heavenly kings and gods of Triatsushima, heaven, who live on Mount Sumeru, will not even know or realize where they've gone to. Only those destined for enlightenment will be able to see that Sumeru has been put inside a mustard seed. This is called dwelling in the doctrine of emancipation beyond comprehension. There are also references to kalpas of time. So this was one idea, was the, the, the space, spatiality of this. And there's also references to kalpas of time being compressed into seven days, and seven days extending to many kalpas of time, um, and of many other extraordinary feats. So this chapter goes, goes on and on and on with these extraordinary feats that are just beyond comprehension. Um, this, these are all to say that the conditioned, the provisional, is limited, but the absolute shunyata is beyond comprehension. Using mortal measures of time and space becomes a delimiting factor. And this chapter actually tells us that faith and obedience, uh, obedience, not obedience, are a necessary element in following the path. So this is one of the few sutras, that, except for some of the very famous sutras, like the, the Sutra of Perfect Faith, that really deals with the notion of faith. Now, obedience means that one respects the teaching so much that they bow down to it. That's really what it's speaking to. So that one, in, in this sense, is speaking to the nature of what do you finally need to understand this? You know, and, and this is a direct contradiction to a lot of the other sutras that you're going to read, where it says, you have a problem, meditate. You still have a problem, meditate more. Right? This isn't saying that. This is saying there has to be something beyond those practices. There has to be something that you, I, I'll refer to, I'll, I'll use the term sacrifice advisedly in this case. There's something that we have to sacrifice for in order to um, realize the nature of shunyata, 
It's not merely, we can't do it intellectually. That's what it's saying specifically. We can't do it intellectually. We would like to. We think we can. Because we're arrogant enough to think that everything we can do can be intellectual. We can figure it out. Nothing in the world is beyond our ability to figure out. This is saying belonging. This is saying exactly that, belonging. And it's saying that ultimately, faith and obedience are, are really necessary. Um, awakening is beyond the constraints of our notion of time and space and the condition. Ordinary conditioned comparisons are totally inadequate. In other words, it's telling us, unlike many other sutras that talk about awakening, it's telling us that awakening is something which is attainable, but it's not, well, okay, at this point, I'll say that it's attainable. If we read the Tathagata Garbha Sutras that are coming out about the same time, they're telling us it's not attainable because we already possess it. But in this case, it's because these were separate sutras written in slightly different times, written by slightly different groups of people in different thought processes. But it's telling us that to really um, attain awakening, it requires more than just applying the butt to the cushion. It requires more than just following. Specifically, it's saying that that when it said, you know, it, it's not even following the form of the order, which means you're not following the Vinaya, you're not following the code of discipline, that you, yes, you should follow the code of discipline, but that in and of itself is not going to bring you to awakening. That's just the form. Awakening is beyond that form. And this is saying specifically that faith and opiate, and I'm, I can never pronounce this properly. Um, obeyance. 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 That obeyance are really are really part. Yeah, obeyance is what I was looking for. Thank you. Next, next slide. So, major theme of the chapter is that <laughs> there we part to see that. <laughs> <laughs> and for those who are um, popularly, culturally inadequate, the TARDIS is from Doctor Who from the 1960s, which is still on television. Mm -hmm. And the TARDIS is a police box that is larger on the, out on the inside than it is on the outside. So my question is, did the writer of Doctor Who get the TARDIS from the Vimala Kirti Sutra? Or... Was Buddhism anticipating Doctor Who? Oh, was the it time the first time lord? Okay. That's right. <laughs> Vimla Kirti may have been the first time lord. That's the other option. That's the other option. That's other option. So Vimla Kirti said, Ah, Shariputra, the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. No, that's not what he said. <laughs> that, that is what he said, but I've already read that. Um, the major theme of the chapter is Bob Thurman said, We are creatures magnetized by the binary. We like to take positions, good and bad, male and female, relative and absolute, duality and non-duality, all pairs of op opposites. As human beings, we seem to have a few alternatives, but to use concepts in our daily life and to approach experiences such as non-duality or emptiness or our experiences of the relative world through dualistic thinking, ways of thinking. Most of us know, however, that perception offers infinitely graduated continuum of experiences. However, language is frequently reduced to two antonyms for each feature. Language more or less forces us to use this binary process. Even in our digital world, because of modern quantitative science, we use one and zero and have just recovered the old linguistic comfort of binaries, as one scientist noted. In realizing emptiness or a boundless state of heart and mind, the duality of non-duality and duality itself is transcended, for neither duality nor non-duality exist and in and of themselves. And yet this does not mean by passing suffering, look at the example of immaturity and a sickness, uh, not one, not two. In other words, this 
chapter is specifically suggesting that the notion of binaries, the duality that we see, is a false notion. And it's, it exists because of our conventional existence, not because that's the nature of reality. The nature of reality goes beyond that duality. And that's specifically what this chapter is, is discussing. Next. <clears throat> in conclusion, as I've said in the past, this sutra has been very popular. It's never had a school of Buddhism constructed around it like the Lotus Sutra or the Avantam Sutra. But it has its own attractions. First of all, as I said before, it's humorous and at times a bit irreverent. At the same time, it's filled with teachings which were elaborated in greater detail later, such as through um, the Garjuna. But it sets the stage for those teachings. So it doesn't fully give us the um, definitive word on those teachings as Nagarjuna does, but it, it points us in the direction. And specifically, it purports the limiting delusions of the Shravakas, the ambivalence of the sexes, the advantage of the Mahayana over early Buddhism, the transcendental body of a Tathagata, the benevolent and saving power of the Bodhisattvas, and finally, Shunyata, emptiness. And these are all lessons that are at the heart of the Mahayana teaching. So thus ends chapter six. Mm. Next <laughs> slide, please. Ichishima Sensei, do you have any comments about the Vimla Kirti Sutra before we open it up further? <coughs> well, thank you. Well, the uh, Japanese pioneering uh, leader of uh, Buddhism was uh, Prince Shotoku around six centuries. He selected uh, three major Mahayana sutras, uh, such as Roda Sutra, Shrimara Devi Sutra, and this Vimalakirti Sutra. And I think uh, this Vimalakirti Sutra is very important to understand Mahayana Buddhism and uh, the tantric uh, development of Buddhism. For instance, uh, Bob Thurman, uh, his translation, the holy teaching of Vimalakirti from Tibetan language, it says, uh, uh, page eight, introduction, he says, uh, description of Bimara Kirti as vast in esoteric uh, practices, the description of the family of the Tathagatas. Bimara Kirti was identifying wisdom as a mother and the liberative, liberative technique as father exactly correspond with central tantric symbolism of male and female as Vajra and Bell and the like. Like this, and also uh, uh, page uh, 67, this is very important verse, I think, uh, in the Bhimara Kirti, of the true Bodhisattvas, the mother is transcendence of wisdom. The father is a skill in liberative technique. The leaders are born of such parents. So this uh, verse is very interesting to understand the uh, development of Mahayana and Tantric Buddhism. And the Saicho founder of Japanese Tendai, he really based upon these three sutras. And uh, he says uh, already, Prince Shotoku uh, laid the foundation of Mahayana Buddhism as uh, the Lotus Sutra. So now the Lotus Sutra's seed grown up uh, after 200 years. And so uh, let us digest and uh, this Mahayana Sutra. I think uh, this is a very important note. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sensei. Thank you very much. Um,